Here in the U.S., we have exported many things to the world, not least of which has been culture. Whether it's music, film, television, or imagery, we have made the way we experience our lives in the States its own commodity. And there are certain things that are inherently American and could only be fully experienced here in the States. One of those things was and is the American diner. Begun around the turn of the century, the original diners were actually converted rail cars that were drawn by horses to serve blue-collar workers, largely immigrants, a quick and affordable bite to eat. After World War II, diners appeared across the country, especially with the blossoming of car culture and newly built American highways. In the early 70s, Elliot Kaufman, then a young photographer, began a personal project documenting some of the classic diners that had yet to be supplanted by fast food chains. The five-year project resulted in a book and an exhibit, which helped to launch his career as a commercial photographer. However, to the frequenters of those diners during that time, he likely appeared to be just a boy with a camera and a big idea. I kept going back. And I kept going back. And they knew that I was serious. Oh, yeah, I want to do a book on diners, you know. And they go, oh, yeah, who's this kid? You know, but I was a kid at that stage in time. And, um, but I kept coming back. And, they, and I would come back and I would give them a print of what I had taken of them or of the diner. Or so, and they put it up on, this, on the sandwich board, you know, the way they would put different pictures of the family on the sandwich board. They put my photo of the diner up there. So it became a real familial thing that we, we had. So it became a much easier approach to doing the portraits. And that's why I think the portraits have an incisive quality to them, if I may say. It was such fun. They were great. You know, there was nothing like it. It was really fun. Elliot did more than just document the physicality of a diner in the 70s. He photographed a moment where a diner was as much about the personalities who worked and frequented it. It was a place rich with characters, which included the diners themselves. They were structures that could take on a different persona, depending on its occupants and even the time of day or night. There's a lot of waiting around seeing how the light changes and how the light fell on the diner at certain di times of the day. And then at night, at night got me, you know, most excited. And it was, you know, at the beginning of maybe thinking about doing architectural photography later on, I wasn't doing it at that stage. It sort of got me into the idea of how a building can change personalities according to how it is lit how it is placed as the night falls and all that stuff. And then I go back inside and talk to the regulars. We will talk to Elliot about how and why he returned to this work and released a new edition of the book and how the original helped launch his career as both a muralist and architectural photographer. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. Elliot, welcome to the Candor Frame. It's a pleasure to, uh, to have you on the show and, uh, and have a chance to talk with you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I do really appreciate it. The, the ones I've listened to have been really excellent, and I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be part of it, your podcasts. And thank you for sending out the book on, on diners. Diners have always been a part of my upbringing. Uh, as a young kid, my family and I would do a lot of traveling in, in the car. So diners were an integral part of it. But it was really fascinating to take a look at your work, which kind of documents the life of diners in the early 70s. It's time I still kind of remember, but uh, I thought that it was really fascinating to have a chance to sort of revisit not only the architecture, but the people who, you know, who frequented and worked in those in those places. And I think it's a, a real great collection of not only photographs, but of American and Americana. I, again, I think it's a, it's a wonderful body of work that you, you created. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's what the goal was. And uh, even then, think of it, it was nostalgia. Even in the 70s, we were kind of accused of nostalgia. But hell, now, it's, uh, it's, it's vintage. 
<laughs> but let's let's start with the overall history of the diners, which go back all the way back to the early twentieth century when they started as just rail cars that were or converted rail cars that were, you know, just parked in uh, in front of businesses where general blue collar workers went to have a you know a cheap and easy meal rather than a sit down restaurant. Why don't you just take us back because the the history of the the diner is so rich and really a, an interesting part of food culture, especially during that part of uh, the nation's nation's history. So why don't you just kind of walk us back briefly and give us an understanding of the role that diners had uh, uh, then and throughout the uh, part of the later part of the twentieth century? Right, and uh, they were some of them were horse drawn. You know, when you go back far, and then there was a guy in Province, Province, Rhode Island, who had a truck who pulled, you know, it was like the beginning of truck culture now, but he pulled a diner. He pulled like half a diner onto the, the Civic Square, you know, served food out of that and drove it home. I mean, it was wild in that regard. You know, post-World War II was really the boom. I mean, it, there really had a lot up to that. But then with, with all the sort of manufacturing advances that were made in World War II, they were able to build diners in a factory. And they were able to build them with everything to them. The stools, the kitchen, the counters, everything was made as one. And then you bought this as a business. They even branded it for you. All the plates were branded, all the glasses were branded, and you came in, and it, a lot of the original owners were short order chefs in, from the Navy and from the Army. They were guys that wanted to strike out on their own. They had a skill they learned in the, in the armed services, picked the site, they rolled it on, <laughs> skirted it so you didn't see the wheels. And you had a business. Yeah, and it was just a wonderful opportunity for entrepreneurs of the time who were interested in starting a restaurant, uh, inexpensive, relatively inexpensive means of being able to, to do that, just because you didn't have to you know, have huge upfront costs in, in terms of buildings and land and stuff like that. And you had the flexibility of locating it in areas that uh, weren't being offered a lot of food choices. Yeah, well, that's what you were able to do. That's uh, sort of, it united those two elements. That's where it all began. So that's why the look of them is really from that period. I mean, the look of them was, sin was sincerely 40s and 50s. I mean, that's when it really took off. You know, what's in interesting about the whole history of diner design is that they were initially largely dominated by a couple of families around the New Jersey area. But as you know, the interest in these grew, especially, as you said, uh, after World War II, there were designers and manufacturers throughout the country. And hence, you would see different variations on what was basically a tried and true diner design, which was like based on a, on a counter with seats and a cooking area. And later, as they became bigger and they moved beyond just the limited size of a, you know, of a, of a train car and included more bench seating and things like that, at the heart of it was still that initial initial design and i'm wondering as an ar architectural photographer what were some of the sort of the, the the variations that you saw as you explored diners not only then but subsequently uh you know because you've been you you photographed the images for this book in a particular period of time but i'm you know as you've talked uh, before you had a real interest in the history of it well you know they were as different as the manufacturers there was a a manufacturer called jerry o mahoney who was the best, and their, their, their diners were like none other. And there were a number of others that uh, followed suit, and they were all in New Jersey, you're right. And New Jersey was the heart and the soul of diners, I must admit. One of my co-authors, I had a, a, a co-author who was a, an architect who did the history, the annotated history of the diner for the original book. And, he, I mean, we could drive down the road and a mile away, he'll tell you who the manufacturer was. I mean, he was just tuned into every nuance and every, every curve and every window and every vertical slat and horizontal slat and every porcelain enamel. I mean, it was wonderful. And we all collected those pieces and parts. <laughs> we had a million of those pieces. 
Well, tell me about the visual flourishes, those details that really attracted your attention, especially since you were photographing them in the 70s. I did early 70s, yeah. Yeah, early. Yeah, 1970. When I started out, I started out in like 1970, 70, 71. In 1972, I started doing that book and, and almost immediately got a, uh, a contract with Harper and Row. I mean, it was sort of miraculous. I mean, you can't do that today. I, I did it with a very, very close friend who was starting his own practice as an architect, and we did it together and started together. It was going to be, originally, photos and interviews, and he was going to do the interviews, so it was going to be this kind of vibe to it, but that never quite worked out. It, it became something different. It became a history and a, a photo essay. And one of the, the great things about the book, as much as it is about the physical, you know, the physical nature of the diners, what's most interesting in the images that I love the most are the people, the characters that you met that made diners a real big part of their lives, whether they were working there or, or eating there on a regular basis. Yes, yes, and, um, yes, yes. And, and I'm wondering that over the five-year period in which you were photographing the diners and the occupants, you know, how that experience of actually interacting with the workers, with the people who frequent in the diners in the morning, having a cup of joe and, you know, eggs and bacon or whatever they were having in the morning. How did that personal connection with the people impact the or influence the, the work that you were doing? Yeah, it was crucial. I mean, I kept going back and I kept going back and they knew that I was serious. Oh, yeah, I want to do a book on diners, you know, and they go, oh, yeah, who's this kid? You know, but I was a kid at that stage in time. But I kept coming back, and, they, and I would come back, and I would give them a print of what I had taken of them or of the diner, or so, and they'd put it up on, this, on the sandwich board, you know, the way they would put different pictures of the family on the sandwich board. They put my photo of the diner up there. So it became a real familial, familiar thing that we, we had, so it became a much easier approach to doing the portraits. And that's why I think the portraits are, have an incisive quality to them, if I may say. It was such fun. They were great. And, and, and you know, there was nothing like it. It was really fun. You know, one of the things that it brought to mind for me was how fast food culture really changed the dynamic, dynamics of public dining. With fast food, it's all about in and out. Just get your food, eat it, and leave. There's no interaction with anyone else other than the server. Get out. Right? So, but dining culture was really about a, a community hub where regulars could sit down and have conversations with the cook, you know, the wait staff, the waiters, the other, the other clients. Uh, if you're going there on a regular basis, you were always seeing familiar faces and had an opportunity to engage, whether it was a small town or, or, or a big city. And that sense of community is at the heart of what a great diner is. And I'm wondering how important was that for you to capture while you were working on these, these, these photographs? For sure. I mean, I would go there and the same guys were in the same corner of the same diner at the same time of day. And they'd stay all, I mean, through dinner, you know, and then some of them who didn't have a place to go home, they would stay and they would just sit and chat with the waitresses all night long. It was, or as long as they could <laughs> stand in anyway. Yeah, there was just a real commonality to it, a real thread of, of, yeah, I could hang out here. This is my home, my home away from home. Every day the same guys would hang out, and it was mostly somehow guys. It was like workmen going to work, you know, and uh, the female characters were the waitresses, were the service personnel. You know, there wasn't, um, there wasn't, there weren't women coming from work or to work. It was mostly a, a guy thing. Back, back in that day, for sure. One of the interesting things about the photographs is that the when you shoot the exteriors, oftentimes these diners would be in this almost like virtual open lots. They weren't squeezed into a bunch of you know, other storefronts and, and, and buildings, which photographically provided you a, a wonderful way of being able to get a very clean shot that uh, showcases the architecture and the presence of the, of, 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 the, of the building. But I think it also gives a context in terms of you know, the role that this played in terms of where they were located. 
And it's kind of like the food trucks that are oftentimes in like in parking lots here in Los Angeles. But talk to me about the role of location here in terms of you being able to tell the story of diners. You know, in in the book, in the photographic essays, there's a lot of pulled back images. I mean, with as much space left and right as possible. So they felt kind of alone, but occupied the space in a very kind of interesting and active way. That that was purposeful. I mean, I would pull way back. I mean, at night especially, you know, with traffic going by and you see this this lit up beacon of, you know, multicolored lights coming at you. But yes, that is really true. And there are some portraits that I did of people in the parking lot. You know, there was there's one it's it, I think it begins the book where there's one as a waitress. It was she was the first one I photographed at Cavie's Diner on Route 130 outside of Philadelphia. I'll remember that. I just I said, "Come on outside." I I put her in the middle of the parking lot and I stood back and there she is, this small figure in this large parking lot with her diner in the in the background. It just was uh, v- very exciting. But you're right. It do- it does have that that act, active quality to it. And one of the, the great things about the diners that you photograph, and even some of the diners that are, you know still exist now, is that there's such an abundance of line and shape, not only in the exterior, but in, in the interior. And with a lot of these you know vintage designs, you have these large windows in which all this great light is coming into the scene. So, you know, behind beyond the activity of the people, you know, working and eating at the diner, I just I can just imagine that there were just so many details, big and small, that that drew your attention. Tell me about, you know, looking and finding and photographing elements like this. There were. And there were, you know, it was a lot of waiting around. There's a lot of waiting around seeing how the light changes and how the light fell on the diner at certain times of the day. And then at night, at night got me, you know, most excited. And it was, you know, at the beginning of maybe thinking about doing architectural photography later on, I wasn't doing it at that stage. It sort of got me into the idea of how a building can change personalities according to how it is lit, how it is placed as the night falls and all that stuff. And then I'd go back inside and talk to the regulars. And then I'd have a whole other set of photographs to be done there. So it had so many aspects to it. You know, the, it, it, people, places, things, you know, pots, pans, glasses, dishes. I mean, you know, there, was, there, was, there wasn't anything in there that wasn't photographable. <laughs> well, tell me about just the... the process of taking pictures and sort of editing as you're shooting because when you have that long of a period of time to shoot and and it's going to end up in a, in a book or maybe even an exhibit you're, you're dealing with a limited number of images and because you're really ultimately trying to tell the story you have to be very conscious that you are producing a diversity of, of imagery so you're not endlessly re- repeating yourself and like we, like we just said, there were so much that you could, could shoot, but you still have to be thoughtful because you have an end game behind it. And I'm wondering what your process was in terms of producing those images. Well, that was a process, as you can well imagine. Once we got a contract from Harper and Row, we hooked up with this guy named Knock Waxman. And he was the editor uh, in the food area, funnily enough, of Harper and Row. And he established a, a, a work process with me where I would make four by five inch prints and stick them up on my wall. I had a large wall in my studio. And sometimes I'd have a hundred of them up there. And he'd come down and we'd spend the entire day saying yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And then is when it really got to me that I'm doing a book that needs to be edited. I never really understood that before. I was, you know, just starting out. Everything was gorgeous. You know, everything was beautiful. <laughs> it was like, there was you know, no photograph was not, you know, not the most beautiful thing ever. But anyway, so it taught me the editing process. He taught me the editing process. And I'm really thankful for him because uh, it was a really worthwhile time spent. Now, you obviously were shooting film in, in the early early 70s. So t- tell me about 
you know, just your whole process in terms of how much film you would expose. Were you, you know, were you being very generous in terms of the images that you make? Or practically, did you have to be, you know, frugal, not just in terms of cost, just because you had to, you know, process and proof sheets and all that stuff that you have to deal with film? I, I, I kind of never knew how to be stingy. I was always like, you know, I'm, a, I'm here to shoot. I'm going to shoot what I see and shoot as much. I, I never held back. But once the editing process happened, I must admit, I went out to find certain kinds of images that we needed. And that was a little, I didn't like that as well. I, I, it was a little uh, difficult for me. Yeah. Because then, uh, well, you know, okay, we need, uh, we need, you know, a, a diner from across the street. I don't know. I'm just, mm -hmm. or we need some more signs, or we need a family, or we need this and that, or we need more waitresses. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we don't, we don't have enough of this or that, and and so it it confined me a little bit because I was so interested in just shooting what I saw, and letting that happen as my story unfolded. But I'm glad I did it that way because, you know, it made, it taught me an incredible amount for the rest of my career, that process of editing. I mean, I even taught editing later on in life and made sure that everybody knew how to throw something away that didn't fit with the, re the remainder. Throw that eighth image away because you only need seven. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a good lesson. You know, what's interesting about your career is that you started with a book. And most photographers do not start with a book. They, they usually have a very long and lengthy career. And after they've been in the business for 20 or 30 years, they think, hey, you know, it's about time that I put out a book. And uh, that's the way you began, which is just fascinating. But I'm wondering, you know, with the release of the book, did you leverage it? Did you use it as sort of a, a, a calling card when you started going out there and, and establishing yourself as a, as a working commercial uh, photographer? Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, w it really was the first thing that I did. Oh, well, let's start out. I'll do a book. And that's what it was like. It was in 1972. The book came out in the fall of 1979. So that was a, a long time for me. I'd never done anything for that long a time. Then, uh, you know, it was the first exhibit I had. I had several exhibits in Philadelphia and Houston. And then it was written up in magazines, New York Times. I mean, it gave me a notoriety that I never had before. And so, yeah, it was a way to you know, step into a career. But in the meantime, while I was doing that, I had to be doing something else. I couldn't be doing just this book. And so I had to be establish myself in something else that can actually make money which I did. That was the murals that you and I have talked about. So luckily I was able to do that simultaneously. And, and why don't you talk about the, the mural work that you were, you were doing? You know, when, when I was uh, trying to learn photography and I was accessing a lot of the students at the Philadelphia College of Art, where I was living at the time, a friend who was an interior design major got his first job and it was called General Waterworks. I don't even know what the company did, you know, I want to know the truth, other than knowing that it was General Waterworks. And he asked, he said, why don't you do a mural? Why don't we do a black and white mural? It's 11 foot wall, eight, eight feet high. I said, yeah, why not? I'll figure it out. So I went out, <laughs> I went out to the park in Philadelphia, the Wissahickon Park, and photographed a waterfall that had that same proportion. Well, I sliced it to have that same proportion of eight by 11 feet, and then put it up on that wall. And it was sensational. It was like the biggest kick I had had up to that point, commercially anyway. So I then showed that to somebody else, and they hired me to do seven murals, and then somebody else hired me to, so it, it really took off from there. I mean, it, it ended up where I was, uh, you know, shooting the, for, you know, for an insurance company, for instance, hired me, right? And, and they just like, no holes barred, like, do what, you, do what you think is right. You know, it was like, <laughs> pretty insane. But, but the great thing about it is because no one else was doing it, you became the guy. I became the guy. Yeah, and I think that I, I love I love stories like that. I think it's it's great. 
no one no one knew kind of what I was doing other than it ended up being these great murals. I mean, it, in in the Colonial Pen Group, right? Which is a you know, it's a big insurance company. You'd think it'd be real conservative. I was photographing people waiting in the waiting room and put a mural of those people waiting in the waiting room in the waiting oh. room. So I'd play on words a little bit. You know, at the end of a hallway, I'd photograph the end of a hallway and put a mural at the end of a hallway of the end of a hallway. I mean, it was like that kind of thing. And so I was playing with Trump Loy. I was playing with, a, with all of these sort of um, play on images. I remember there was one where someone marked their binders with the whiteout, you know, mm -hmm. marked what they were. So I photographed that and put that up in that same area. So it was this handwritten, you know, 19... 64 to 1969, something like that. I don't know. So it, it was really, really fun. I did uh, for a pipeline company. You know, they flew me into a uh, oil rig in Louisiana, and I climbed up this 100-foot ladder. Don't ask. <laughs> shot down the, you know, the, uh, the, what did they, the roughnecks, they called them, the roughnecks. God, it was like nothing else. It was such fun. It's hard to believe that the year is almost over. I feel like I just got started. But when I look at the interviews we've released this year, I see that there have been many hours and days that were spent not only producing the show, but just living life. And I'm very grateful that over the past year that you have chosen to make TCF a part of your life. We've been able to produce some amazing and fun conversations, and we're very much looking forward to bringing you even more in the coming year. You can help us to continue doing this work by supporting us financially, and the easiest way to do that is to become a Patreon supporter and commit to a reoccurring donation of $5 or more a month. For example, your donations are helping us to invest in some new microphones for the studio and my work in the field, which will further improve the audio quality. But most importantly, it helps us to meet our monthly cost of production. This show doesn't and wouldn't exist because it's an income earner. It's a labor of love for all involved. So it's only because you listen and contribute that we are able to do this each week. If you haven't already, please visit patreon.com forward slash the candid frame and become a Patreon supporter today. You can also support the show by writing a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And even better, if you really enjoy an episode, spread the word via an email to a friend, a post on your social networks, or word of mouth. It makes all the difference. So thanks for your support and being part of TCF. You know, what's, what's really fascinating about your journey as a photographer was that, well, what I sometimes see some photographers do when they're, they're trying to get their foot in their door or establish themselves as photographers is that they'll change the way that they shoot because of the expectations of others, either other clients or because they see other people working in a particular way and they think, oh, that's the way that you have to do it. And you, on the other hand, seem to have been always, or for the most part, creating images in the way that you liked creating photographs, whether it was for the diner or whether it was the work for, for these murals. You weren't really having to sort of adjust yourself for anyone else's expectations. And I think it's really fascinating to hear the story of a photographer who largely was building their body of work their career uh, on their own terms. I mean, you literally, literally were left defining yourself as a photographer from the very beginning. Good word, defining, in the sense that you know they said, "Okay, well, what do you want to do? What do you think should be done here?" And, you know, and I said, "Well, why don't I shoot you know the the Bear Tooth Highway in Colorado for this sixty foot mural? It would be incredible." And they said, "Okay." And they gave me the budget to do it, and I did it. I mean, it was that kind of thing. You're right. It was, well, you know, for the the, uh, the Knoll you know, International Furniture Company asked me to do these murals, and it was for a, it was actually a temporary installation, but it was murals nonetheless. And they 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 wanted to do 
the elevator doors at their showroom on Fifth Avenue in New York. So I suggested that we take the designers, and these are kind of, you know, in the design field, very well-known people, and take their product, take their chair in the elevator, and go up and down, and I would press that button of that particular elevator each time they, so it would stop on that, on my floor, and then shoot in the elevator. And there they are sitting on their chair or holding on their head. And there are these people kind of like <laughs> not knowing what's going on. And um, not that I was, I, I wasn't poking fun, but I was making it into something that it didn't need to be and making it into a, 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 a special moment. That's the way, you know, Smith Klein, Smith Klein Beckman, a big pharmaceutical company, they asked me to do these cafeterias, these bland corporate cafeterias. It's like, oh my, what could be worse? But what I said was, I will do the great mansions of this country. And I went to the, uh, the John Deere estate in Florida, uh, John Deering, who founded the John Deere company. And I went to the Ringling Museum, which is this Romanesque fantasy of Ringling. And, and, then, and, then, and then I went to San Simeon in California and derived the murals from those three locations and got full access each time, full access. Yeah, that's great. You know, one, one of the things this reminds me of is one of the most important lessons I've ever had. And, you know, when it comes to working with clients, you know, they always tell you what they want and what they, you know, what they need, which, of course, you need to satisfy as a professional photographer. But I think you always have to go beyond that, or I always have to go beyond that and think about what do I want to bring to this project? It's more than just me sort of, you know, fulfilling all the requirements of, of the job. I need to be able to recognize what I want to bring to that and be able to communicate that to the people who I'm going to be working for in order for me to not only provide them what they want, but maybe something a little more than they could have expected. And uh, it, it seems like with all the work that you were doing, you were just doing j just that, that you were always sa satisfying two masters, your client and then also yourself. You really wanted to deliver something unique and, and special. Yeah, much more than what you seem it should be <laughs> or, or imagine. They had no clue. That's the great part of this, is that it was so new and so fresh. And every, almost every presentation, final presentation, was with, like, the CEO. He wanted to know, she wanted to know what this was all about. <laughs> mm. And so it went right up the chain, and uh, it, that could not have been more exciting for me. It was great. I learned a lot. Yeah, and, and people will no doubt say, well, this is not, you know, 70s. You're not dealing with those huge budgets anymore and, <laughs> and, and complete license. But you've managed to, you know, have a career over you know, many, many decades. So you've evolved. You've had to change. You've, you've had to uh, adapt in any myriad of ways in econo you know, in an economy that's up and down and all over the place and unpredictable. But, but, but tell me about how you have, you know, changed and adapted over, over these many years. Well, you know, once I did all this, all these, you know, the diner book was really basically, you know, from a back door, it was about architecture. I, I worked with, you know, two of my best friends at the time who were architects, and it sort of rubbed off. It sort of, I sort of tried to understand how they think. Then these murals were kind of architecture. And I was working with architects and interior designers. And then when I was photographing the murals, I was saying, look how it comes alive in a very different way than what I intended it to be when I'm photographing it. So it's a whole, that was a whole other level of it, that I had to photograph it to show somebody else how great it could be. So then when, when the sort of photographic murals sort of became ubiquitous, let's just say, you know, with, you know, you can send a slide over to one of the big photo houses and they'll make a building size image of it and paste it on there. I decided to walk away. It was just, uh, it, it was too commercial. It was no longer fun. And the lucky stroke that I had is that I was asked by the public art fund in New York, which, which uh, commissions public art, sculpture, painting, and the like. 
and uh, they asked me to submit an image for a competition for a 45 foot by 35 foot wall in Jersey City for the for the Port, uh, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And I won that competition. And I saw this image go up 45 feet by 35 feet. It, it, it wasn't uh, printed, it was hand painted by a sign painter. This is how long ago this was. It was sensational. And I said to myself, I can't, I can't do any more with this. Or, or I'll go broke, I know I'll go broke. I just can't do any more with this. So um, I, I felt that was a swan song to that whole career. Uh, and, and so I, I taught myself architectural photography. I mean, I took those, I was photographing the murals, but then I, you know, I had to get serious about it. So I bought a four by five camera and said, oh, well, this is a novelty, let me learn this. And I taught myself how to use a four by five camera. And I was just so excited by it. And then I started teaching myself how to sell it to people that I can do this. Because they had heard of me with the murals and so I said, oh, here, let me show you what else I could do here since, you know, you're not uh, buying my murals anymore. <laughs> you know, and that's one of the most interesting parts about as your career evolves is that you have to sort of re-educate people that you've worked before with that you're capable of much more than they've seen. It's not easy. It wasn't easy at first. But then when certain people kicked into it, it was like, oh, this is great. You know? Yeah, it, it, this can work. It kind of reminds me of that whole joke about a photographer who has a portfolio, a food photographer. So he has, a, say, a lot of fruit. He has cantaloupes, he has strawberries, he has kiwis, you know, has virtually everything. And then the person who's hiring <laughs> looks at it and goes, yeah, but can you photograph all a watermelon? Because I don't see any watermelons <laughs> In your portfolio. Oh, that's it. You nailed it. You nailed it. There's, that's it. That, is, that was the sort of, unfortunately, the idiocy of commercial photography. It, it, we always laughed about it. It's like, you know, you mean you, you don't know how to put a cup over there? It's, I mean, this is, the place is empty without a cup over there. You know, I mean, something like that. So that inspired me when I started to get work. It inspired me to work with these people and to understand them and their intelligence to what they do and try to combine it with mine. Yeah, yeah, because on occasion I've worked with con you know, a contractor or a designer or uh, you know, someone who's working on them, usually private, private homes. It's really interesting the, the level of detail they get into it. Sometimes it's about the, the particular type of glass that they use uh, and the way that when the light strikes it, it uh, affects the tiles that are being used in the kitchen or the stone that's being used. And there's a level of uh, attention to detail that to me as, you know, as just a photographer, just a normal guy, I really would not recognize. But when I hear them describe it and why they made those choices, it gives me a much more a greater appreciation of what they've accomplished as an artist. But then the challenge becomes, how can I, as a photographer, convey that in the finished photograph? Because, you know, beyond the sort of technical considerations of, you know, exposure, using a tilt-shift lens in order to correct perspective, that might give me a document of what the scene looks like, but it may not necessarily render an image that captures the level of attention and detail that the contractor, the designer, the architect, all of those people have put into the work. So how easy or difficult is that for you to, in order to be able to translate what they've shared with you and you to be able to, to successfully create the final photograph? Yeah, it, 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 was, it was essential. Because you're right, it's not this tilt and shift and do this and do that. It was really about the nuances and about the process of architecture. So if you were able to show process, if you were able to show what it felt like being in that space, not so much the space itself or the way the light comes in and this and that, it is what it feels like. It's like, the, you know, we, we always talked about the lust mm. for space that you need to have when you, when you look at a photograph, that you wanna be in there, you wanna like crawl in there. And, and if you can't, then it's just a, a picture. You know, it's, it, it, it no longer has that quality of life. How, how do you achieve that? How do you give life to uh, a, a space, into a room that consists of 
walls, windows, doors, you know, line and, and shape. You know, there are no people in this shot, and somehow you're supposed to give it life by whatever techniques as a photographer that you have at your disposal. So anytime you walk into a space and you have to evaluate it for the purpose of a photograph and, ev and evoke that sense of wanting to put yourself in there, how do you, how do, you do that? Well, you know, not only what you've just described, which you just described very well, but what they don't tell you. It's like, you know, certain, certain uh, fields, you know, okay, we want the, the apples, uh, uh, you know, to be over here and the, and the bananas to be over there, so it divides, whatever. They don't tell you. Architects, designers, they don't tell you. It's a mind game that, you, that you're playing with them. And you have to be in their minds. You have to be in their space. You have to be so understanding of their language, that they speak or don't speak. And I learned that. I learned that. And then once, once I started to understand it, I was able to achieve it. It was not easy. It was not easy. But some of my favorite, I mean, to take it out of that interior, that residential interior, and take it into places like Lincoln Center. I did a lot of theaters. And that is glorious. I mean, you're in a you're in a space that is just you know uh, I don't know hundreds of feet here and there and up and down, and you're in control. I mean, you can say to you know lighting tech, uh, uh, be up there. Could you take that down ten percent? And then he does. It's like, oh man, this is great. <laughs> and you know, I did that the uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music, Lincoln Center. I, I I've done a million theaters. I I did a lot of work for an architect that did almost nothing but theaters, and that was sensational. And it's all about light. It's all about light and lighting. And, and you were dealing at a time with, with film. You didn't get immediate feedback. You were dealing with lights that had to be jailed different color temperatures a film with a particular color temperature i mean there were so many things that you had to you had to figure out in order to get oh, a decent man. A decent <laughs> photograph don't remind me <laughs> so, tell us about that don't remind me hours gelling fluorescent lights so they mix with the daylight and then oh please you know transparency film was a true test of photography i mean it was a true test because it was unforgiving. Until one film came out, uh, I forget when it was, Fujifilm came out with a, with a film that had a fourth layer. Yeah. Provia. No, that no, that wasn't Provia. It was... Um, uh, no, no, um, it, was, it was NP, NPL, NPS and NPL. Okay. Four by five. It was only in four by five. And it fit into the Polaroid backs. I mean, it, it gave us one level of ease in our <laughs> it was almost like shooting black and white mm -hmm. you know you were dealing with tonalities yeah. because all of the polaroids are black and white so you were dealing with all tonalities of black and white and then you know the color film went in but it for years and years and years it was torture i mean we take i don't know eight hours to make four shots that was not unusual wow. Whereas it eventually got where in an eight hour shoot, I would do 25 because I would just, you know, run around and shoot. And, 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 and you know, with the digital uh, being so forgiving and, you know, I just changed blue, yellow, this, that, the other, red. And, you know, I'm off and running. But th those were the days where there was a four. I mean, when somebody did five or six shots in a day, it was like, oh, my God, he must be. Speeding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things about even when you transitioned to digital, all that experience gave you an advantage because I could imagine that you walked into a space and you could take a, take a look and you knew exactly what kind of light sources you were dealing with and what to sort of anticipate in terms of what you were going to need to do. It wasn't just about discovering these problems later when you have the image on your computer and you're having to sort of fix it in, oh, in Photoshop, yeah. for example. I mean, you, you knew what you were dealing with with a lot of people ended up doing that and uh oh well i'll figure it out later you know you shoot you, you know you're, you're there you shoot it you know you're there that's when you do it that's when it all happens it doesn't happen in, in the computer 
And uh, I, I did not um, do, I mean, I was okay with the computer and, you know, doing basic retouching, but I, I was not someone to change around images and make them any better than they were when I shot them. Because they have to be right when you shoot them. It's all in the negative. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's all in the negative. If it's not there, it ain't there. Let's let's go back to the uh, the diner book because this is the second edition of the book and the first one came out uh I think in the late late 70s 79 okay. correct. So this is a second opportunity to reissue the book, but you had a chance to look at the old photographs some of which found their ways into the book and some of which you hadn't seen probably in a very long time. Oh, it, it was great. I mean, it's the, the only word I can possibly use. I mean, um, client came around, called me out of nowhere. I don't even know how they found the book. And I never asked, actually. They said they wanted 50 copies. And I said, I don't even think there are 50 copies around. I wouldn't know. I don't have them for sure. And they said, can you make them? I said, sure. I went back. I found, I had to go, obviously, research. And f I found each negative from each page. And then, basically, I, I, I scanned them right here in my studio. I have a pretty decent scanner, enough for what I needed. I relived every image. That's what was so great yeah. about it. I remember that moment. I remember the, her face. I remember how I asked her to stand by the cashier, by the, this, you know, those three women. I mean, I, I remember everything about every shot. It was like reliving the whole seven years worth of photography. I loved it. It was great. And then I was able to ask my co-author, who did a history of the diner, that uh, in the first 60 or some odd pages, we conferred and we agreed that I should eliminate that section, even though it was his section. Neither one of us ever liked it the way it was designed. It was not designed the way we would have wanted it. It was designed by Harper and Row, and it was, and the printing was uh, was very very mediocre back in the seventies. I made sure to ramp that all up and got the um, page by page. I even l eliminated some photographs. Because I was when I was going through, I was saying I never liked that shot. I'm going to eliminate it. So I, I left some pages blank, which is happens a lot in books now. And I didn't feel at all guilty mm. <laughs> about eliminating some photographs. So I just got rid of them. So it was real freedom. I did include the original color photographs, which I thought sec I had second thoughts about, but you know because it. You know, I wanted it to be a pure photo essay from that period. But I, you know, the, the cover was a color cover. The back cover was a color back cover. So I, and then there was an eight page signature in the front that was color. Only because when we were about to publish the book, the publisher came to us and said, you know, color photography is coming in now. 1979, <laughs> would, you, would you like to do some color work on this? I said, well, so they gave me a few bucks to go back. And, and so I had to go back to a lot of the diners. But when I went back, I didn't do anything like what I did originally. Originally, it was, you know, gritty and people and places and, you know, plates and glasses and, you know, sh light shining off. What I did was pure, almost like architecture. You know the glinting of the stainless steel and 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 this kind of thing. It was it was almost like architecture. That was as close to architecture that I got in the book. Was the color section in the front? Uh, you know, I was very happy with how this second iteration has worked out. It's really really fun. Having a chance to revisit that older older work, when you looked at it again, what did you? think about yourself as a photographer? Uh, you know, I thought that photographer was pretty good, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'll tell you why. I was really young. I was really, I was just starting out. I was in my probably early 20s. And I was getting stuff that, you know, with, with a bold sort of approach and uh, with clarity and with, you know, I was very happy with how that book worked out. And 
you know, I wasn't at the ones that I eliminated were the ones that I didn't like. So I was happy to get rid of them. <laughs> but but uh, uh, the ones that I kept, I, I was uh, I was very proud of, I must say. That was a, a, a proud book for me. Well, you have every right to be proud of with this book because it's one of the my one of more favorite books that I've received this year not only because it brings me back to a moment of my own personal nostalgia but just because it's done it's just done so well huh, and uh, thank you. it's 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 done in a way that I think I would have liked to have shot myself thank you so yeah I can't I can't recommend it heartily enough to, to people to check out but my last question, which I ask each guest, is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone that you have long admired or someone that you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it two, if I can, if I may. Only because, you know, I have this uh, 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 good friend who I think is a wonderful photographer. His name is Harry Wilkes. And he is, he's been so dedicated to, to, to this medium for so long. And he's been so focused for so long. And he does such good work. And uh, I'm going to recommend Harry Wilkes, W-I-L-K-S. Now, the other person who, have I, who I've admired, who is a, uh, an architectural photographer, but has never really, never really worked as an you know, per se architectural photography, but uses that medium for his artistic medium is Andrew Moore. And Andrew has lifted the, the genre of architectural photography to an art form. And he's one of the few who has. And I would recommend him as somebody who I would, who your listeners could look at with, with a lot of uh, admiration and education. Well, thank you for those recommendations, and thank you again for, for being on the show. I really enjoyed talking with you, and I uh, do appreciate being part of your uh, ca candid frame, and I'm looking forward to hearing me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Elliot for sitting down with me. Find out more about him and his work by visiting ecoffman.com. I also have two upcoming workshops, the first in Los Angeles in November at the Los Angeles Center of Photography and in Tokyo, Japan in December. You can find out more by visiting nobechicreatives.com for my workshop in Tokyo and lacpphoto.org for my workshop here in Los Angeles. And check out our YouTube channel where I offer comments on photography submitted by TCF listeners who contribute to the Candid Frame Flickr pool. Check out the TCF Flickr pool and our YouTube channel by clicking on the link in the show notes and the website. My latest book, Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, is now available. You can purchase it today and receive 40% off the list price when you order it from the Rocky Nook website. Use the promo code Pirello40 at checkout to take advantage of the discount. And receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks by signing up for the Candid Frame mailing list, where I share thoughts about life, photography, and keep you updated on TCF events. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or donating through PayPal. Not all episodes may be available on your podcaster app of choice. So to download, listen, and share any and all episodes of The Candid Frame, download the TCF app for Apple iOS and Android. And because of your support, it's free. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer, Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. <laughs>